Tonight, there is a, I want to share with you a passage of scripture that has just really captivated me for probably the last 12 to 15 years. I mean, it's one of those verses, it's a single verse in the Bible that if I had to say most of my faith rests on this verse, if it's a verse that I said that, that it, I have the aspirations to live my life by, it is this verse. It is um, just, for me, has had the most powerful impact probably of any verse in the Bible, and I want to share that with you tonight. But before we read that verse, before we talk about it, I kind of want to set the stage for what I'm going to be saying. In the three years of Jesus' public ministry, um, he assembled a group of followers, and he called them his disciples. Now, to us, when we read the Bible, if you read the Bible and you hear talk about disciples, we're just kind of used to that. And by the way, those of you that are fanning yourselves, we're trying to get the, you know. Some of you are going, no, don't make it colder. And some of the rest of you are going, please, I can't believe I wore a turtleneck tonight. <laughs> Um, I'm in the, I'm in the, I can't believe I wore a turtleneck crowd, so I'm, I, have, I see that fan and I raise you about three of them. But um, <laughs> it wasn't unusual for teachers to have disciples in that day. It was very common for great teachers to have those who follow them, and they called, all of them called them their disciples. So it wasn't unusual for Jesus to have a group of people who followed them and to call them his disciples. The Bible says that Jesus wasn't particularly handsome or flashy. There wasn't anything that was so attractive about him that people just couldn't help themselves. But there was something so winsome about him that as he went about the countryside there in Israel talking about God's love and about how God was a good father and, and um, who God really was, sometimes people, the Bible would say, there were some fishermen that would just, they heard him talk and it's like, you know, they drop their nets and they walk away and they follow them. That's the kind of impact that he had on people when he heard them speak. And um, sometimes people think that Christians, that Christianity is just for really weak people. You know, the people who need a crutch in life, the people who just can't make it on their own, the people that are kind of weak in their personality, or they're just, you know, they're just, they're just kind of those kind of people and they might need Jesus and that Christianity is just for those kind of people. But I want to tell you that as Jesus was in that public ministry for three years and sort of collecting disciples, if you will, he said some very, very hard things to his disciples. He said some of the hardest things that anybody could ever say to another human being. He demanded the allegiance of those who followed him. I mean like complete, total all. He said, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to give your all. I mean, that is certainly not for weak people. That is something that really only probably strong people are going to be able to even handle. But if you're new to church or if you're new to faith or maybe you just came tonight because, you know, somebody that you know invited you and you're kind of really not sure what you're doing here and some of these people are a little strange and what is it with all these arms up and around and <laughs> thank you, my arms are very good right here by my side. I mean, you know, some of you are just like, I don't get any of this at this point and that's okay because what I want you to know is that you are here tonight with a group of women who are at every stage and phase of faith some people have none whatsoever and are here just to please somebody they care about and welcome we're so glad you're here some people have been coming to church for a while you if you had faith in the past and you don't really at this moment some of you have had faith since you were children and it's been strong some of you had faith of chill as children and then kind of really walked away and your story is really interesting of all these little you know ins and outs and meanderings of how you ended back in a close relationship with God and some of you never walked away and some of you love him with all your hearts and some of you are just taking tentative little steps I think really what I want to tell you is that we are all at different stages and places of being a disciple. Some are in the crowd, some are brand new, some have taken some big steps, some have taken some really, really big steps. But what I want to tell you about Jesus is something that you need to understand, that, that he asks the most hard things. He asks more of us than any dictator has ever asked, now hold, hang in here with me, of any dictator, it's going to be good, just hang in. You know, dictators ask a lot of their followers, and I want you to know that God asks more of us than any dictator has ever asked of any person. But here's the difference. Jesus is the only one who has asked for our all, who has also come to be with us, who suffered for us. Now, he no one created us, 
but he has suffered with and for us. And he lives in us. He loves us. Nobody has ever done for you what God has done for you. And so when he demands our lives, he's the only one that has the right to do so because nobody else ever created you, suffered and bled and died for you, and gives you salvation. He's the only one has done that. But there's two pieces of good news that I want to tell you about that as you listen to that is one, if you're new to faith, new to even, you know, coming to church or anything, while that may seem a little strange, a little scary, I will just tell you that you have your lifetime to grow into what it means to follow Jesus and you can be a disciple, one of those followers of his at any stage. Brand new, been around for a long time, walked away, come back, it doesn't really matter. Wherever you are in that space, that place, you can be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Rick says, one of my favorite quotes that he says is, when you come to Christ, you give it all up to him and then life has never been so good. When you come to Christ, he asks for it all, and then life is never as good as it is when you've come to know Jesus. But it's also really important to tell you that as Jesus started that three-year public ministry and said some really hard things, he didn't start with the hard things. He started with things like, hey, you guys, come and see what I'm doing. Just come and see what I'm doing. Man, that's simple. That's easy. Anybody can take that kind of a step. And then over the years, he began to turn up the volume on what it was that he was telling his disciples that they needed to do and be if they were really going to be his true followers. And the passage of scripture that I'm going to have us look at tonight is the pinnacle of those hard things. He started simple He started easy, come and see, come see who I am, see the miracles that I do, see the way that I I respond and love to you, the way I respond to people on the edges and the margins and the outcasts, see how I reflect God's love to all these people. Very simple, healed the blind, cared for the sick, raised the, I mean, Jesus did some amazing things and people wanted to be near that. But then in this particular passage that we're gonna look at tonight, this is now the peak of the hardest things that he ever says to anyone who is going to follow him. And that's what I want to talk to you about tonight. Mark 8.34 says, Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, it's not a complicated scene. As I said, crowds followed Jesus constantly. He was never without a crowd. I mean, he had to work very hard to ever be alone because crowds were just around him. They surrounded him, thousands and thousands of people at a time. And so on that particular day, it wasn't unusual that there was a crowd around him. But Jesus draws a distinction right off the bat. And he says, listen, all of you, you know, you and a crowd, and we're certainly a crowd here. He says, you and this crowd, come closer because I want to tell you how to move from just being in the crowd to actually being one of this much smaller group that I call my disciples. And I'm going to lay it out for you, Jesus said. It's not even like, well, you had to guess what it was he was talking about. I mean, he just kind of nails them right between the eyes when he says, look, if you want to move from being part of the crowd to being one of those who are actually my disciples, there's three things that you're going to have to do. He said, first, you're going to have to deny yourself. Then you're going to have to take up your cross. And then you're going to have to follow me. Well, those were some pretty hard and strange words. And Just imagine if we were that crowd. I mean, we certainly qualify as a crowd here tonight. And some of you, as I said, in this crowd, imagine yourself standing there hearing Jesus say to you, listen, if you want to move from just being on the fringes, from just kind of dipping your big toe into the water of what it means to follow me, let me tell you what it's going to look like. It's going to mean you're going to have to give me your all. You're going to have to deny yourself. You're going to have to take up your cross. And you're going to have to follow me. Well, I think that if I were to rephrase that today in words that maybe make a little more sense, some of you grew up in church and you've heard this passage of scripture, you've read it yourself a thousand times, heard a thousand sermons on it, and some of you might even be just a little tempted to just kind of, I heard that one, I don't have to really pay attention, I know what she's going to say. And, um, and I would, I'm just begging you, really, from the bottom of my heart, that you would listen tonight as though you were hearing this challenge from Jesus, 
for the very, very first time and see if there's not some way that he wants to apply it deeply in your life. I, the words that I use, the words that have captivated me over the last 12 to 15 years have been, if I think of it like this, what I think Jesus is asking me is to become dangerously surrendered, seriously disturbed, and gloriously ruined. <laughs> dangerously surrendered, seriously disturbed, and gloriously ruined. So now, the NIV version of the Bible says to deny yourself. Well, that's not a very pleasant place to start. I mean, I'm not personally into denying myself. I don't have a lot of interest in saying no to myself. I am much more interested in saying yes to myself and no to everybody else. I don't really, I'm not particularly interested just on my own in surrendering to God. And I, I think maybe some of that is a cultural thing too. I mean, as Americans, American citizens, we are not about surrender. That is not in our makeup. That is not a word that comes easily to us. In war, in conflict, armed conflict, all throughout our history, people surrender to us. We do not surrender to other people. We stay in the fight till other people surrender to us. That's just part of our cultural makeup. Think of it as you will. If this just kind of has shaped the way that we think about the word surrender. Or then think about maybe if I took that to a little bit smaller level, if picturing surrender, why it's so negative to us. I think that many of us picture a criminal, someone maybe who's robbed a store and is running from law enforcement. And law enforcement chases that person down until they're backed against a wall and they have nowhere else to go. And all they can do is just kind of like, okay, I surrender. I mean, I surrender. So we think of it in terms of bad people have to surrender to good people. Or maybe even some of you, if you took it even more personally than that, you were bullied a lot in your life. Maybe you've been bullied a lot. Maybe it was part of your past. But most of us can remember at least one time in our lives when there were other people who were making fun of us, who were mocking us, who were calling out something about us that was different than other people, or just being mean, that just for the sake of being mean. And there is that sense when you're bullied of people who are more powerful, people who have um, authority over you, or people who are physically stronger and bigger. And you remember that sense of just feeling like you, all you can do is just kind of cower and, 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 and hope that they stop noticing you and leave you alone. And maybe sometimes the only way you were ever left alone is if you just basically said, all right, Right. I surrender. Go ahead, make fun of me or mock me or do whatever you're going to do. Surrender to us has a really negative connotation. But in God's vocabulary, I think surrender may be one of the most beautiful words that God ever hears us say. When we say, God, I'm saying yes to you. I am surrendering to you. I am giving all to you. Those are the most Beautiful words that God ever hears us say. And I think those are the words that touch his heart more deeply than anything else we can ever say to him. But to surrender to God, to deny myself, and to say yes to God is not an easy thing to do. And here are the reasons I was thinking about this week. The three reasons probably why it's always been hard for me. See if any of these apply to you. The first one is comfort. My comfort. Um, I call it the kingdom of me. And in the kingdom of me... I am the omnipotent queen in the kingdom of K, and in the kingdom of K, I do my best, substitute your own in name in there because we all live in the kingdom of, fill in your name. Um, so in the kingdom of, in fact, we're going to do that. You can just say, I live in the kingdom of, and you can tell your name. I live in the kingdom of K. Right. So we are all the queens in our own kingdoms. And in that kingdom, we do our very best every single day from the moment we get up in the morning till we go to bed at night to arrange our lives in such a way that our lives are comfortable for us. They suit us. If I drive up to um, a stoplight, I fully expect it to turn green before I get there. And I'm a little peeved if it doesn't. I'm being honest. If I'm looking for a parking place in front of a store, I just have this sense of entitlement. Well, of course there should be a parking. I don't want to walk around the parking lot. I want to park close. I want that arranged to my comfort. When I come home from work and, um, and I've maybe had a full day and, and I've, I've got all these things I want to say, 
I, this is the honest truth, I want Rick to listen with rapt attention to every pearl of wisdom that drops from my lips. I want him to look interested. I want him to be interested. I want him to engage in what I'm saying. I am not as interested in listening to his day, to his thoughts, to his feelings. I'm being honest because in the kingdom of me, I want my life to be comfortable, and I want it to please me. Well, I'll just tell you, that sort of gets in the way of surrendering to God. That is certainly not denying myself. Something else that has been a battle for me most of my life is control. Because to be honest, I am a little bit of a rebel. And um, it has gotten me in some trouble throughout my life. Um, and the fact is, you guys, I just really don't like anybody telling me what to do. I don't. I, I, there's a perpetual three-year-old on the inside that's going, make me. <laughs> I may be standing in this corner, but inside I am not. You know, whatever, all those perpetual three-year-old things. And it's a really odd mix because I am a rule follower. I like rules. I like my rules. And I think my rules are really good. I may not like your rules, and I may not follow your rules, but if your rules make sense to me and they also fit in with me, I'm a rule follower. But I'm also a little bit of a rebel. <laughs> Um, and that sort of also has gotten in the way of me saying yes to God through my life, of me surrendering all to him. Gary Thomas, one of my favorite writers, says that what gets in our way of surrendering to God is our addiction to running our own lives. The reality is we are all pretty addicted to running our own lives. We don't like it when God asks us to do things. We don't like it when God says, but this is what I'm asking you to do, and if you're gonna be mine, this is what you're gonna need to do. Man, there is a battle royal that goes on in my soul with God over who's in charge of my life. I am addicted to running my own life. I like my own comfort. Those things are kind of easy to spot in each other and in yourselves. I'll tell you something else that's gotten in the way of me really saying yes to God and surrendering to him more than I do. It's not as easy to spot, but I tell you it probably has um, more effect than either of those two, and it's fear. Because fear, it's like this. When the day is over and I'm lying in bed at night and it's just me and my pillow and the universe and God and, you know, activity has ceased and everything's quiet and, and, and nothing else is going on, those are the moments in which I ask questions like, if I really say yes to you, I mean like really, just flat out, lay it all out there and say yes to you, you're going to hurt me. You're going to... You're going to let something really bad happen to me if I fully say yes to you. If I just say, Jesus, you can have me. You can have my will, my past, my future. You, you can have it all, Lord. You can have it all. I have this fear inside of me that if I do that, that that will be the moment God says, this is the moment I've been waiting for. You just wait to see how I squish you under my will, how I flatten you with bad stuff. I don't know where I got that idea, but I'm telling you, if I'm being really, really honest, there are some moments and have been some moments in my life in which that has predominated with me. And, and because of that, I've tried to do something that I call play deal or no deal with God. See if you've ever played deal or no deal with God. It's this, God, I love you and I trust you and I will be yours, but don't you touch my kids. Man, I'm going to love you, and I'm going to serve you, and I am yours till kingdom comes. But if you touch my health, if I get cancer, or somebody I love dies, I mean, like, deals off, God. No way. No way. And what we do is we act like God is our enemy, and we start withholding little pieces of ourselves. We say in our minds that we play this little game of, okay, well, I'll, there's this relationship, and, and I know I probably shouldn't be in that relationship, but I mean, come on, I'm, I really, 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 really like this guy. And so I'm going to have this relationship over here, but God, you just, you just stay over here, okay? You just stay over here, and I'm going to love you, and I'm going to serve you, and you're going to not see this part over here, and if you touch it, we're done. 
Or we start saying, you know, my dreams and my aspirations, the things I want for my life, some of you who are younger are worried that you're never going to get the career that you have studied for and you've worked for and you have prepared for. And what if you say yes to God and he says you can't ever be that that you wanted to be? Or if you have a, a fear that, that one of your kids is, is something's going to happen to one of your kids. For moms, that is probably the deepest fear that most of us have, is that something will happen to one of our kids. And without meaning to, without doing it consciously, we just start withholding little pieces and parts of our lives as though we can protect, as though we're trying to protect them from God. And it's all because we're so afraid that if we say yes to him, that he's going to hurt us. That is such a misperception and mischaracterization of God. Our God is not the enemy. Our God is good. He is good. If you read C.S. Lewis, The Chronicles of Narnia, or, or seen the movie, which is the way most Americans access C.S. Lewis, um, <laughs> In the movies of Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan represents God. You know, God is this big, incredibly beautiful, majestic lion called Aslan. And one of the characters, who's very small and tiny, asks another character about Aslan and says, is he safe? Because, man, he seems incredibly powerful. And the other character says, safe? No, he's not safe, but he's good. The reality is our God is a bit dangerous, and we like it when he has the kind of power to heal the blind and restore hearing to people who can't hear. When he heals us physically, when he parted the Red Sea, everybody liked God's power. When he makes the sun stand still, when he flings the stars into space by the word of his mouth, when he sustains our universe that way, when he performs a miracle for you when your loved one lives, when your marriage is restored, when the things that you so wanted happen. Man, we love it, and we give God all this praise and all this glory, and we are shouting his songs, and we're all for him. But if it doesn't turn out the way that we were expecting, we don't like God so much, and we become afraid of him, and we start thinking that maybe he isn't good. And if you don't think God is good and you're afraid of him, why in the world would you ever say yes to him completely? Because he might hurt you. Beth Moore says that when we withhold parts of ourselves from God, those who withhold themselves from God will not have God's power and, and strength when evil comes. And she says evil will come because evil will come. And those who have not withheld any of themselves from God will find that they can access all that he is and all that he promises when evil comes. You guys, I've had breast cancer. I've had melanoma. My precious daughter in love, Jamie, nearly died from a brain tumor 10 years ago. My Matthew took his life. Evil has come. Evil has come to my life, to my home, to my family. But evil has come to my family, not because I said yes to God, but because evil will come. This is an evil world where evil reigns temporarily. Evil will come whether evil will come, and I can't stop it, and neither can you. And those of us who have experienced evil have also known that God is there and God is with me. God is with me. God was with me. God will be with me. Evil will come, and evil will come in your life. <laughs> evil will come in your life. Don't withhold any of yourself, of your loves, of your passions, of your desires, of your aspirations for your life. Don't withhold them from God thinking that by doing that, you can keep evil from coming. Evil will come because evil will come. But those who have fully entrusted themselves to God will find that they have all that they need to survive, thrive, and do well in this life. He is good. And when you are convinced in the core of your being, I mean down into the weeds of your soul, that God is good, that God is good, that God is 
good. You can say yes to him, no to yourself, and make a dangerous surrender of yourself to him. Some of you, God brought you here tonight so that he could say to you, I have been talking to you. I've been speaking to you in the quiet of the night when it's just me and you. I've been speaking to you through nature. I've been speaking to you through others. And I've been telling you that I love you and that you can trust me and that I'm good and that I'm asking that you would move from being just someone in the crowd to someone who is identified as my disciple. You are saying yes to me. Well, Jesus doesn't stop there. He's got three things that are hard that he says. First was deny yourself, say no to yourself, say yes to me. And then he says, take up your cross. Whew. Okay, buckle up. Visualize the scene with me again. Jesus is talking to a real crowd. This is not a parable. This is not an allegory. This is not just some made-up story. Jesus, on one particular day, was talking to that particular crowd with those particular disciples right there with him. And as he's standing, telling them how to move from being part of the crowd to being one of his disciples, I mean, I just kind of visualize he's standing talking to the disciples and the crowd, and just kind of maybe out of the corner of his eye, he looks over and he sees a man who has got a cross on his back and that man is walking under the weight of a cross up to a hill where he will be crucified this is a criminal a criminal has been caught and the penalty is death and so he has a cross he's getting it was the Romans favorite way to torture and kill people so he's got this big cross on his back and he's carrying it up this hill and Jesus seeing that says listen you want to be mine you have to say no to yourself. You have to deny yourself and you have to take up your cross. Listen, nobody took up a cross in that day unless they were going to die on it. They didn't have cross tattoos. They didn't have cross Bible bookmarks. They didn't have lovely art with painting of crosses. A cross only existed to kill people. There was no other reason for a cross. So when Jesus says, if you're going to be mine, this is hard. This is hard. He says, if you're going to be my disciple, you must be willing to take up your cross. Now, the commentators, the people who study this stuff for, as a profession, sometimes have tried to make this very spiritual. Well, you know, we should all live sacrificial lives. Yes, we should. Um, you know what, if you grew up in poverty, you could say, that's your cross to bear. Or you had a really bad family life, that's your cross to bear. Or you've got bad health right now, uh, that, that's, that's my cross to bear. Well, okay. But, but remember, nobody took up a cross unless they were going to die on it. I think Jesus was not just saying, yes, we need to live sacrificially, and yes, we need to live in light of other people. But I also believe that he was saying, if you are really going to follow me, there is at some point in your life a place that you are willing to die for me if I ask it. If I ask you to give your life in my service, are you willing to do that. I mean, that's hard. But Jesus didn't just ask us to do something he wasn't willing to do. Jesus was in heaven, and he became so disturbed by my sin, by my brokenness, by the fact that I was separated from God, that there was no way in the world that I could be restored to a relationship with God because of my sin. Jesus was so disturbed by that that he left the comfort of heaven where his bidding was done, where the angels did everything he asked him to do, where he, where he ruled, where he reigned, and he came and he became a human being so that he could die for us so that he could pick up a cross and die for me and die for you, so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be restored to God, so that we could have a relationship with our creator. Jesus allowed himself to be seriously disturbed by suffering and brokenness to the point that he had to do something about it. So as a dangerously surrendered and now seriously disturbed Disciple of Jesus Christ, 
you and I have to allow him to get into the soil of our souls, to dig in there, to root it out, to root out the selfishness, to root out the self-centeredness so that he can shift us in such a way that we become seriously disturbed by the brokenness and the evil in this world, so much so that we have to do something about it. So let me just ask you, what disturbs you? How long has it been since you were disturbed by anything in this world besides the trivial and the mundane and the ultimately meaningless stuff? You know what we get disturbed about? We get disturbed about the price of gasoline. We get disturbed about the price of chicken this week. We get disturbed about whether our favorite couple on Dancing with the Stars got voted off or whether our favorite sports team got out of the playoffs. Those things disturb us. Look at Twitter. Look at social media. People are so disturbed by some of these things. Most of us are. How long has it been since you were disturbed by some of the things that really matter in this world? The things where evil is causing people to suffer, to die. How long has it been since you were disturbed by the number of orphans in our world? There are about 163 million children, boys and girls tonight, going to bed without a mom and a dad. Does that ever even cross your mind? How long has it been, if ever, that you were disturbed by the fact that there are more slaves alive on our planet than have ever lived in the history of the world? There are more people in slavery today than have ever been at any other point in our world. How long has it been since you were disturbed by the fact that most people live with a crushing sense of loneliness? So much so that Great Britain has appointed their first minister of loneliness an epidemic, that suicide is the number two killer of college students, that in Orange County tonight, people have fought the rain for three days who have no home, and they've tried with cardboard or under bridges or under makeshift tents or with nothing. There are immigrant children separated from their parents. Has that disturbed you lately? How about entrenched racism? There is so much evil in our world. There is so much that seriously should disturb us. But we live very comfortable lives, arranging everything to suit our comfort, our control. We live our lives ignorant, completely deaf to the sounds of evil and suffering in our world. And if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, you will let him disturb you about our world in such a way that you cannot help but act. You cannot help but move out of your comfort. You cannot help but do what you can over something that disturbs you. When I became an advocate for people with HIV about 12 13 years ago, I was completely ignorant about HIV. I mean, I knew nothing, absolutely nothing. I just knew God had called me to care for people living with HIV. And so I, I thought that if I hung out with people who were HIV positive, I might become HIV positive myself and get AIDS and die. And so I prayed and I said, God, I know you're calling me and you're calling our church to care for people with HIV. And if in so doing, I become HIV positive and I die, then so be it. My life is yours. Now that was a really ignorant prayer because that's not, HIV is not transmitted by hanging out with people who are HIV positive. But that, that my prayer was ignorant because I didn't know the facts. But my point is, in my ignorance, I still knew that God deserved my life. And if serving him and serving people who were in need meant that I would lose my life, I'm yours. You can have me. And so I think that if you really decide that you're going to move from the crowd, you're going to take steps from the crowd to becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ, and you're going to allow him to create a dangerous surrender in you, 
that just says, man, I'm yours. I trust you. You are good. And you say, God, you have my permission to seriously disturb me about brokenness in this world and people who suffer. Then I think the result is going to be this. You're going to become a ruined person. You're going to become a gloriously ruined person which is what I think he talks about when he says, follow me. What does it mean to follow Jesus? Because that sounds so simple and so blah and so whatever. I mean, follow Jesus. Yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. What did it mean? What, here he says, deny yourself. And then he tells them, hey, and you've got to be willing to die. How could follow me be something that was kind of like anticlimactic and mean nothing? No, I think to follow Jesus, to really follow him, means that you're going to become ruined for normal life. Normal life will no longer satisfy. Normal pursuits will no longer satisfy. I am a ruined woman, a gloriously ruined woman. God ruined me about 15 years ago, and I've not been the same. He completely took my life and turned it upside down. And so I'm gloriously ruined for him. Well, what does it mean to be ruined? I think it means that you make a decision that you're going to follow Jesus to the end of discipleship, and you don't know where that end is. You don't know what it's going to cost you. You don't know what it's going to mean. You don't know all the implications. You don't know what your yes means to God, but you're okay. You're all in. And so you're going to follow to the end of discipleship without knowing where that end is or what it's, going to unta- what it's going to entail. And when you do that, you're going to become gloriously ruined. You're going to let God, you know, we studied uh, emotionally healthy spirituality, a lot of us did here last year um, at Saddleback. And, and the picture on the front of that book grabs me every time because it's a picture of an iceberg and you know how an iceberg you know you see just a small portion of an iceberg and below the waterline the bulk of the iceberg is under the water and that's the way most of us live our lives all that any of us see of each other or see of each other's lives is what's above the waterline you can't see what's below the waterline in my soul and I can't see what's below the waterline in your soul but God does and God is in Interested in going beneath the waterline of your soul and my soul and changing our pursuits and changing our passions so that we are ruined for life as it is. Now, some of you are like, I'm not particularly interested in having my life ruined. Thank you very much. I just got it all together. <laughs> Don't you be messing with my life. Well, let me tell you, especially for those of you that are, that are really young, Some of you are going to pursue, you're going to give all your energy to pursue the American dream. Health, wealth, happiness. That's the typically defined American dream. I want to tell you that the pursuit of the American dream in and of itself will ruin you. The pursuit of the American dream in and of itself will ruin you. How many pairs of shoes can you have before it starts to feel a little hollow? How many electronic gadgets and gadgets can you have before it starts to feel just a little bit hollow? The pursuit of the American dream just in and of itself, by itself, will ruin you. But listen, so will being a gloriously ruined follower of Jesus Christ. And if I'm going to be ruined, if I'm going to follow him to the end without knowing where the end is or how far it goes or what it's going to cost me, that will ruin me. But if I'm going to be ruined, I want to be ruined for something eternal, for a kingdom that cannot be shaken or destroyed. Jesus preached an upside-down kingdom. He came preaching a kingdom that was so far from the American dream. Jesus came and preached a kingdom that was not built on the strong and the powerful, but on the weak and the powerless. Jesus did not build a kingdom built on the beautiful and the affluent, but on the wounded and the poor. Jesus did not build his kingdom on those most likely to succeed, but on those never who are going to succeed. He didn't build his kingdom from those that are at the top of the heap. He built his kingdom from those at the bottom. 
He didn't build his kingdom on those who were at the center of it all, who were in the center of power. He built his kingdom on those who were on the periphery, who were on the margins, those that were on the edges. He did not build his kingdom on those who were on the inside, in the cozy, cozy inside. He built his kingdom on those that were on the outside. Luke 14, 12 to 14, speaking to Jesus, he turned to his host and said, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, don't invite your friends, brothers, relatives, and rich neighbors, for they will invite you back and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. And then, at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Jesus clearly had compassion on the least and the last and the lost, and we say that we do. But so rarely are we willing to be ruined and disturbed and surrendered enough to go after them to move out of our comfortable existence. But to follow him is to let him ruin you. A few years ago, I was in Russia, and I was at a home for out in the countryside because they're for addicts, for people who had been drug addicts or alcoholics. And um, at that part of Russia, in rural Russia, there was no rehab, there was no treatment centers. Um, to just get people away from their normal environment, there were people that had to go miles and miles and miles and miles outside of the city, and there were some Christians who had opened a rehab. Three quarters of those people that were there had, um, had HIV, and they were dying, and uh, they had no access to the life-saving medication that's available here and now many other places in the world. They were skinny, 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 shunned by society, but there was a light in their faces. Most of them had come to know Christ. And as I observed these skinny, dying people with a light in their face, most of them told me their story of finding a God who offered grace for all those burned bridges, forgiveness, for all the mess ups, that there was a God who loved them. How did they know? How did these people who had trashed their lives know that the God loved them? Because there were some people who opened up a place for them and set the table and said, you belong, you belong, you belong. On that same trip, I met an orphan girl named Ira. And Ira had grown up in the orphanage, been there since the time she was a baby. And she was told every day of her life, you don't matter. You are not important. Nobody cares what happens to you. Nobody cares. If they cared, you wouldn't be here. They mocked her. They were mean. And Ira grew up fighting. I mean, you know what happens. You, some of you heard those kind of messages as a child. And you know what that does to the very tender psyche of a child. And Ira became a fighter. And she fought guys she fought girls, it didn't matter, she was raped, she became an alcoholic, she began to sell her body, and at 15, she aged out of the orphanage and she was on the street in Moscow. And she met this young couple, Peter and Masha, who were Christians, who said, hey, Ira, God loves you. And Ira's first response many of those times was, oh, right, God loves me, that's why I'm an orphan, right. God loves me, that's why I was raped. God loves me, that's why I am an addict. God loves me. But Peter and Masha invited all those street kids over to their flat, and every night they cooked noodles and tomato sauce and called it spaghetti. And they let the street kids hang in their house where it was warm. They listened to music, they talked, and they began to say, Ira, we love you. And Ira began to believe if she told me her story, that if Peter and Masha could love her, then maybe the God they were always talking about could love her as well. And Ira became a follower of Jesus Christ. How did Ira know that there was a God who cared that she was an orphan? How did Ira know that there was a God who cared that she had been raped? How did Ira know that there were second chances? How did Ira know that she mattered? She knew that because Peter and Masha figuratively and literally set the table. And they said, welcome. Come. Come. 
You belong here. God loves you. You guys, I'll close with this. Colossians 1.15. The Bible says there that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Peter and Masha made the invisible God visible to Ira by the way that they loved her. Those folks who ran that home way out there in the rural part of Russia where they had no medication, where they had very little food but a lot of love, how did those folks come to know that there was a God of second chances? Somebody set the table. Somebody set the table and said, you're welcome here. You belong here. God loves you. They made the invisible God visible. Would you agree that most people in our world do not understand God? And to them... He is invisible. He doesn't make sense, and he's invisible. So how will they know him? How will they know? They will know when we make the invisible God visible, when we decide that we're going to move from being part of the crowd, and we're going to take those steps into becoming dangerously surrendered and seriously disturbed and gloriously ruined so that every day of our lives, listen, some of you may wonder, I really don't know what I should do with my life. I mean, I really don't know why I exist. I don't know why God put me here. I don't know what my mission is. Other people seem to know their purpose, but I don't really know. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'll tell you this. Regardless of what career or what profession or what job you ever do, your number one job is to get up in the morning, surrender to God, let him disturb you, let him ruin you, and go be the visible image of the invisible God in our broken, tortured, suffering world. That is our call. As I said when I started, everybody here, anybody watching, we represent so many different stages and phases of life and stages and phases of faith. And what I want you to know as you leave tonight is that whether this is your first time or you've been here forever or you've been here for decades, is that there's a place for you in a community of women who are some on the right on the edges, brand new, some who've been here a while, some have been for a long time. The point is we are a community of women in process of becoming disciples. And each step of the way is valuable and precious, and you can be a disciple at each one of those. Rick talks about giving as much as you know of yourself to as much as you understand of God in this moment. And that's all he asks. You're going to grow the rest of your life. You're going to grow in your understanding of both who you are and how, where you need to surrender and who God is and how you can surrender to him. But whether you're starting at the very beginning or a long time, you can be a disciple. And so my question is, do you see places that you've been withholding trying to withhold parts of yourself from God. And he's asking you to make a very dangerous surrender. Would you ask him to disturb you? So much so that you will move out of your comfort zone and do something about suffering in our world. And will you let him gloriously ruin you for life as most people know it that is mostly about the mundane and the here and now and has nothing to do with a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let me pray for you. God, we, um, we are in a variety of places and stages tonight. We recognize that. I pray for those who maybe came for the first time and are hearing stuff that maybe a lot of it doesn't even make sense, but would there be just that something in their heart that lets them know that they too are loved and wanted by the creator of the universe, and that you, Jesus, were disturbed by the fact that they were separated from you, and you left heaven, and you came, and you picked up a cross, and you died so that they could have a relationship, a personal relationship with you, maybe for the very first time. And for those, Lord, who've um, maybe lived in more of a faith relationship with you in the past, and life has shaken them, Maybe they just got busy. Maybe there was hurt. Maybe there were painful circumstances that made them doubt your goodness. I 
I pray for any, Lord, who are here and hearing this and long to be restored to that place of closeness with you. Bring them back. And I pray for the women, Lord, who have done more than just stick their toe in the water through the years and the months and the decades. They have come to know you more and more and more as a good God who can be trusted even in the hardest of times. And because of that, they have said yes to you over and over and over again. They have let you stir down beneath the waterline and create a desire in them to be about helping, healing broken people. And Lord, they have said to you, you can do with me whatever you want. Ruin me for life as I know it so that I live for the kingdom that cannot be shaken. God, we want to be that kind of disciple. We don't want to stay on the fringes. We want to keep moving closer and closer to you and closer and closer to each other. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I love you guys.